So, we have been discussing the concepts about hypothesis and the importance of hypothesis in the research project wherein I introduced a specific paper which talks about how it is important, how important it is to develop a good hypothesis which would result in, in a good scientific project and good outcome. So, let us see um, what is an hypothesis and how you develop. The nature of hypothesis, the hypothesis we have already introduced, we are going to talk about the nature of hypothesis. So, what is the nature of hypothesis? You are going to narrate something which you believe is the answer for the question that you are asking. So, it is a kind of expectation or prediction which can be tested and, and it can be proven, right. So, it is a, a simplified statement for a larger problem. So, a hypothesis is a clear statement of what is intended to be investigated. It should be specified before research is conducted and openly stated in reporting the results. This allows to identify the research objectives, objectives, identify the key abstract concepts involved in the research, identify its relationship to both problem statement and literature review. So, what you do is something based on pre-existing knowledge. So, you read, you observe, you do experiments and then you contribute something new with which you are going to say something new that is not known before, you are going to advance the knowledge. Therefore, the readers or whoever is listening to this your research outcome should be made aware as to what exactly you have done and why you have done that, right. So, that is what called as the hypothesis. You have to state exactly why you have done, what you have done, what you obtained and what it means. So, these are the sequences. So, the problem cannot be scientifically solved unless it is reduced to hypothesis. Say for example, we are talking about human system. The human system is a very extremely complex system. You talk about brain, you talk about, so when you study for example, human physiology, the normal textbook would say you have circulatory system, you have um, uh, extra what is called muscular skeletal system, it will say digestive system, it will say nervous system. So, it simplifies each system as nervous system and so on, but it is not as different one another from each other as it is mentioned in the textbook. The reason being, you know, you cannot combine everything and study, it is too complex to study everything. So, you limit yourself to certain uh, key questions and you answer only those without really bothering about how that may affect the other system because it is too complex. We will explain some of those things little later. So, by developing an hypothesis, you basically simplify and you go to a system which is very simple. For example, I talk about immune system in the human and I talk about how the immune cells respond to for example, any infection and so on. Some of the studies are done in culture test tubes or you know in petri dishes wherein you grow these cells and expose them to some pathogen and see how they secrete certain molecules and so on. So, you cannot do it inside the system because there are too many variables. You do not know what comes in, what comes out. So, when you make a simpler model, you are able to understand the specific process with which you are able to extrapolate and tell perhaps that is what happening in the body. So, the cell system that you use in a test tube or a culture dish really does not uh, mimic exactly the condition or all the condition that you see in the human body. But still, that is a simpler system that you can work with, manipulate and ask questions, right. So, it is a powerful tool because, you know, whatever, you know, new discoveries or, uh, or knowledge that you generate is going to help others to advance their project as well. For example, you have used a cell system to understand how uh, the circulating immune cells can respond to an invading pathogen and they secrete certain new molecules that are not known before and you have characterized it. Now, some other group who is working on the human samples can now look at whether the human samples have such molecules present in the blood serum for example. So, now they can may come up with ways to tell, okay, if I detect this particular uh, molecule in the serum, that would mean that they are infected with a given pathogen. So, it becomes a kind of a diagnostic test. So, you have infection, you have certain symptoms, 
for a doctor to know whether you have the infection of that particular pathogen. They may take out little blood and send it to a lab where they quickly do whether you have that molecule uh, compound in higher amounts that would suggest that you have infection. So that is how even a simple you know, culture system can contribute to understanding even to cure a particular infection in the human. So that is how it is powerful, useful, so but you simplify in order to manipulate, understand and you know, design your experiments which otherwise is not possible. This is the example that I gave, cell-cell communication, for example, this is a hypothesis let us say, cell-cell communication is essential for the homeostatic process in human. So when you talk about let us say the blood glucose level, you know, so the blood glucose level in the body tries to keep, you know, within certain levels, therefore all the cells get the nutrient. Whenever you are hungry and you do not have food left, what happens is that blood glucose level goes down or maybe because you are doing certain exercise, you have increased consumption of glucose, then your body has to metabolize the glycogen that is stored in liver muscle and then, you know, push it to the blood, therefore the blood glucose level is maintained. So how possibly, you know, this kind of a communication could happen? One may say that there are hormones that are secreted, there are comes out of the cell and then tells that okay, the level of the glucose in my body is very low or there could be other ways by which the cell can communicate with each other. So that is what you call cell-cell communication. But it is extremely difficult to test it in human body because you cannot do experiments. So what do you do? You can move to simpler culture models and and show, for example, if you starve the cells of glucose in the medium and then the cells would start using the glycogen. Now, once the glycogen level goes down, the cell would like to have more glucose pumped in. So they may have certain proteins which help them to take more glucose inside. Now they may send them outside to the membrane. So this is the process possibly by which they can uptake, you know, take more glucose inside. And this you can study using certain conditions, simple cell models that would help and all our understanding with regard to how insulin possibly regulate the glucose uptake in the cell have come from such kind of models, right? So that is one simpler model which really helped us to understand even solve what is called as diabetic, you know, condition. The other important question that still, you know, requires much more work is in understanding how, for example, the Y chromosome in human, this again say this statement is an hypothesis. Let us say the Y chromosome in human is essential for the male sex development, right? So if it is an hypothesis, how are you going to test it? It is going to be extremely difficult again to test. So what do you need to do? You need to prove, for example, all males have Y chromosome. All females have no Y chromosome in their body. So then you have to look into those individuals that are having Y chromosome but female and vice versa and then look at what are the genes that are involved and there are many other aspects that look, people look into. What we know now is indeed this statement is true to some extent meaning it is not the entire Y chromosome is essential for the male sex but a part of the Y chromosome is essential for the male sex and that has got certain genes these genes trigger certain process during development which allow the embryo to become male. So if you do not have that gene or if you have the gene on the X chromosome 5 by some process that are abnormal but that gene got transferred to X chromosome. So even if that individual is XX but having this gene, he, that embryo would become male and if the gene is defective, even if that individual, the embryo is XY the embryo would develop into a female. So this is how we know now. So you infer from what has happened and then you sort of support the hypothesis and there are of course experimental evidences. Later on people have done what is called as transgenic animals. You take the gene, put inside XX embryo in mouse and then that embryo though it is XX now becomes male sort of proven that that is the gene that is critical. So you develop hypothesis based on certain observations and then you test them and then now you know that no longer hypothesis, these are facts, that is how it happened. So the hypothesis is something, it can be tested, verifiable, meaning 
you prove your hypothesis or falsifiable that that hypothesis is not correct hypotheses are not moral or ethical questions when you talk about you know whether it is x chromosome or y chromosome so males have additional chromosome which females do not have if you make this statement that it it is not talking about the ethical issues or anything it is a scientific question that you are asking it is not about moral or ethical questions you are asking specific questions it is neither too specific not too general so it is it cannot be extremely specific because you generally try to generalize and if it is too general you cannot test it right so that it is somewhere in between it is a precondition of a consequence you sort of predict as to what would happen you test and see what happens is considered valuable even if proven false in the sense that if it is not correct then you go back and look into alternate hypothesis right so you are going to look into some examples and these examples are from a beautiful uh, you know presentations made available by uh, one shalini prasad and others it is available in the link that is given below so what i have done is pretty much i have copied and presented here because i found that to be extremely interesting and you all could get benefited so i'm going to read out the text here and then we'll take out certain hypothesis prediction and we can see whether the hypothesis is correct or not imagine the following situation you are a nutritionist working in a zoo and one of your responsibilities is to develop a menu plan for the group of monkeys so basically you have to prepare certain you know food combination for the monkeys that is there in the zoo in order to get all the vitamins they need meaning the monkey need the monkeys have to be given fresh leaves as part of the diet because you know that is your uh, goal that you have to keep that the vitamins is you know whatever they require it is balanced choices you consider include leaves of the following species of plants basically a b c d and e these are the combinations you know that in the wild when the monkeys live in the forest they mainly eat bee leaves meaning the leaves from the tree that you call as bee but you suspect that this could be because they are safe while feeding on uh, in bee trees because maybe they are taller they stay there and that possibly makes them to feel comfortable therefore they otherwise you know eat in the uh, bee tree whereas eating only any of the uh, whereas eating any of the other species of the tree would make them vulnerable to predation the other you know for example plants where we talk about the leaves b c d or e they may shorter plants they cannot withstand the weight of the monkey therefore they don't climb up you know the predators may come that is a possibility so they go for b even if they don't likely you know like that much still they feel safe therefore they can get so that you design an experiment to find out which type of leaf monkeys actually like the best so you want to now test you offer the monkeys all five types of leaves in equal quantities and observe what they eat and based on the observations now you have to you know come up with certain hypothesis so there are many different experimental hypotheses you could formulate for the monkey study for example when offered all five types of leaves the monkeys will preferentially feed on bee leaves because this is what you think because that's what happens in the wild okay so that is the hypothesis this statement satisfies both criteria for experimental hypothesis that is you can test this right the prediction it predicts that the anticipated outcome of the experiment because you expect that it will eat bee leaves and it is testable because you can give all five and you see what leaves they eat right once you have collected and evaluated your data for example now which monkey ate how many leaves and so on you know your hypothesis is correct or not right so that is how it is let's look into that so the incorrect hypothesis would include the following right when offered all five types of leaves the monkeys will preferentially eat the type they like the best think that if i give five different variety of sweets to you you pick up the one that you like the best right so does it apply to the monkeys as well right so it, the statement is predictive meaning you can test it if that is the case 
but it does not satisfy the second criteria that is there is no way you can test whether the monkeys you know when they take particular type of you know leaves that they don't say that they like the best that's that's the leaf that they like best that you don't have any data it could be because they feel safer eating that tree right so the data will show you whether the monkeys preferred one type of leaf over the other but why they preferred that particular leaf is not something that your data could predict so what you have looked at in this particular slide is uh, the hypothesis you know based on a situation that is just now explained we are looking at an hypothesis and we are looking at the incorrect hypothesis if you are to predict some so one of the incorrect hypothesis would be when offered all five types of leaves the monkeys will preferentially eat the type they like the best this is true if it is humans because if i give you five different types of sweets and you pick up one and eat and i ask you what did you eat you will say this is the one i like the best but you cannot ask the same questions to monkeys so they may eat something not necessarily because they like the most but because probably they feel by eating that they may feel that they are safer you remember we narrated that in the wild they may live on a tree that are stronger taller and because they live on these trees they may eat these leaves and when you offer such leaves in the zoo as well they may prefer that because that 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 would make them safer so that is exactly was mentioned here the statement certainly sounds predictive because you can test by offering all types of leaves but there is no way we can test whether it is true once you have the results of your study the data will show whether the monkey preferred one leaf over the other but why it did so is something that you cannot really do the second hypothesis again incorrect hypothesis is when offered all types of leaves the monkeys will preferentially eat bee leaves because they can eat these safely in their natural habitat this again is an incorrect hypothesis because the statement is problematic because this is the second part because they can eat these leaves safely in their natural habitat is something that you cannot test because you have them here which is you know in caged so you cannot really test it again the third incorrect hypothesis in their natural habitat however monkeys feed that feed on bee trees are less vulnerable to predation than monkeys that feed on a c d r e again this is a perfectly good experimental hypothesis but not for the experiment described in the question because you are in the zoo you are going to test with the monkeys that are captive in zoo so you cannot test it so you need to know when you develop an hypothesis and you want to defend the hypothesis by carrying out experiment whether your test method test tools or the methodology that you going to use can test the hypothesis only then you you know it's going to help you so therefore you should know uh, what methods that are under disposal to you and whether you can use it the fourth example when offered all types of leaves which type will the monkey eat preferentially this is a hypothesis this is not an hypothesis it's a question so often you say the hypothesis is something you know is a kind of a answer to your question but when you make a question it doesn't really you know because it is not having any predictive value you ask a question it doesn't say what could possibly happen you know that predictive value is missing therefore it is not an hypothesis right so that's uh, you know what we talk about in the hypothesis and with this we end here and we start again in the next lecture more examples and discuss Thank you.